Chemistry Department. I'm chair of the organizing committee and welcome to the 2012, 2012 APRON or APRON X. I guess kind of like X Games, but not really. That's totally different. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, um, so this student, this this uh, APRON, I almost said student research. Is it not on or? Uh, we, we need to turn you up a because they can't hear you in the back. They said I'm too quiet. Okay. Huh. Okay. Is that better? Better. The dean is saying no. He must be able to hear me now. So that's why it's bad. Thank you, <laughs> Dean McQuarrie. I appreciate that. Okay, so APRON, something like this, does not just magically happen on its own. There are a lot of people that are a part of all of the different things that have to happen. You'll notice a list of sponsors on the back of your program. You'll notice a list on page 30 of the folks that are on the APRON committee. And you'll also notice in there a list of all the mentors. And these are all people that have worked very hard for our students so that our students can, can look good. Well, they already do great, so... Let's put this together, exactly. Okay, so the this year, we actually have 49 mentors, which is the highest number so far. So that's wonderful. If we can give a round of applause to all of those folks that have put all of this together. Okay, this is APRON 10, which means we probably should talk a little bit about a little of the history of this thing. I think that would make sense, right? Yeah. Okay, so... APRON started in 1996. Now go ahead and do your math. And that's a little weird, right? But we're saying it's the 10th one as well as the 10th one as APRON. In 1996, Dr. Steve Angel and Dr. Donna Lalonde, I see Steve, I don't know where Donna is. I'm sure she's hiding somewhere back here. But they had this idea of doing this student research poster session and put that together and it happened and we know that it happened because we see a program from the second annual. The second annual actually had a program. I'm not sure they had one in the first one. Um, and they had a total of 13 presentations by 19 students in 97. It kept going for a few years, became known as the Student Research Forum. By 2002, we started adding fine arts presentations. In 2003, which is the APRON first APRON, it finally took on that name. Okay? So, a little about some, some numbers. I mean, we could do things like you know, sing happy anniversary or something like that, but I'd rather just look at some numbers about, you know, since 96, how many students have done stuff? So, since 1996, there have been 287 oral and fine arts presentations. That's a bunch. Um, 596 poster presentations, all different students. That's a total of, eight, a, a total of over 880 presentations by over 1,100 students. So this little thought of, let's put this little poster session together, has grown quite a bit over the last 10 slash 16 years. So that's wonderful. Um, and if we think about you know, the students that have gone through, where are they now? They're out in the workforce. They're going off to grad schools. They're going off to professional schools, some of the top schools in the world. They're not only in the city of Topeka, not only the county, the state, nation. They're around the world. And so I think we should congratulate those students for the contributions that they have made, are making, and will make in the future. Okay. Two more things before we get to the real reason that you're here, which is to hear Dr. Jansen and not me. Right? So Doc, uh, uh, Regina Castle is going to come up and, and do a presentation for some posters, and then uh, Penny Weiner is going to come up and introduce Dr. Jansen. So, after the wonderful lecture, downstairs is the poster session and the Caribbean feast, from what I understand. Thank you. Every semester, students in my now editing design class um, aid in developing posters for the, the to announce, hey, it's time to get registered and then to say, come, see what we have put together for you. And so this year we have two students who designed the posters that I hope you saw around campus. And the first poster that you saw um, was this one, and it was designed by Linda Zook, and she is, a, in addition to being in my class, she is also a Bachelor of Integrated Studies major who's also thinking maybe about coming a little more to the mass media side, and we'll gladly take her. So, Linda, please. And then the second student.
student that I'd like to recognize is Melissa Kirshner, um, who she designed the poster, the, the program cover, as well as the posters that might be to the event. And she is a mass media student as well. So, Melissa. It is an honor and privilege to introduce the fabulous Ryan Helge Jansen, as it has been an honor and privilege delight to get to know her. I got lucky. I work next door to Ryan Helge, and I shared rides with her in the process, sharing also treasured conversations about art, road signs, fashion, furniture, language, film, literature, theater, religion, and culture, to name but a few subjects about which she is fluent and fascinating. I asked Reinhold about her philosophy of learning, and she replied, I get totally, she used the word, <laughs> totally charged up when I look at art. Art is important because it tells us who we are, shows us new directions, tells the truth if it's any good. It asks us questions, opens new vistas, you know, terra nova. Art makes us cry, and art makes us laugh. I could tell she had much more to say, and I imagine we'll get a further glimpse of her ferocity and joy as soon as I sit down. I also suspect this will not be her last lecture. <laughs> Reinhold's most cherished and long-lived collaboration with her husband John began in 1963. While pursuing an education degree, she spent a year at Bethel College in North Newton, where the Kansas farm boy won her heart, and she returned to Kansas and John after finishing her degree. Reinhold and John have lived and worked together in Newton, Lawrence, Montreal, South Africa, Democratic Republic of Congo, and at least eight other African nations. Along the way, they had three children and found many opportunities to work and research together. The Jansons were instrumental in developing the Kaufman Museum at Bethel College. John was volunteer director, lending concept conceptual and artistic leadership, while Reinhold worked as curator of cultural history and director of education at the museum for 10 years. While at the Kaufman, they researched, wrote, and published Mennonite Furniture, a migrant to tradition, 1766 through 1910. Their research, book, and exhibition established for the first time, and up to this point, definitively, the historic, cultural, stylistic roots of Mennonite furniture. These roots in Mennonite settlements on the Baltic Sea coast, today's Poland, were spread through subsequent migrations caused by persecution, wars, and the search for religious freedom to North, Central, and South America, and as far, as, as far east as Siberia and the southern Urals. During her time in North Newton, Reinhold was also a humanities scholar, developing topical lectures on things such as art and health, children and childhood in American art, and food as a metaphor for social justice in art. She worked for five years at the Anthropology Museum at KU, where she received her PhD, and we haven't started on her teaching yet. I'll wrap it up quickly. <laughs> Reinhold Jansen has taught at Bethel College, University of Kansas, in Montreal, and at Washburn since 1996. She has no complaints about the rambling, bohemian nature of her travels en route with John. It made life fascinating, she said. When Reinhold and John were in Chicago, she enrolled in a master's program to become a German teacher. After her first distressing class learning to teach German grammar, John had the insight and generosity to ask, what would you like to study? Her response was an immediate and irrepressible art history. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> Reinhild and John received the Outstanding Alumni Award from Bethel College in 2011. She was curator of a special touring exhibit of African art from Kansas Collections, as well as exhibits at the Mulvane, where she was interim director from 2006 in December to May 2008. Reinhild's accomplishments are as formidable as she is tiny. Mm -hmm. I know I'm leaving something important mm -hmm. out, but after 15 years of lingering outside her lecture hall en route to my office, I'm anxious to sit and really listen. So please welcome the always beautifully dressed and passionate Reinhill Jansen. <laughs> you may
may have, did you walk away with my manuscript? I don't think so. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, Penny, for such a lovely introduction. Um, what can I do now after that? Um, so, it's good to be here. Many of you have seen this image. Somebody came up to the podium a while ago and said, well, can we turn off the TV? And I think the implication was that we're going to have some, you know, how to, how to draw your own house um, uh, program. But what I want to do is invite you to my home in central Kansas. Um, I just drove up um, from this place. One of my small regrets, but considerable re regrets all these years at Washburn was that my home is quite a distance away and that I not, could not have you over and um, you know have you be guests in my, my home. That was just too difficult and that was always a regret to me because I am I am relatively social. <laughs> uh, anyway, so today I want to invite you uh, to my home in central Kansas with this birthday greeting from our daughter, um, Gazina, sometime um, ago. It is near the Jansen family farm that has been in the family for over 100 years. And our house now, this very one, it's now somewhat expanded, celebrates this year its 100th birthday. So what I want to do is invite you inside and uh, we want to look uh, at some art inside um, for a rather personal um, journey in life and art. But before we see the first image that you would find in our house among many, I would just like to explain the word Heubuden, which you may have read there. Um, that is the name that we have given our place uh, after we moved it there in uh, 1973. And that is uh, translated, it means basically hay shed or hay barn. And it's to honor both my husband's and my own ancestral uh, heritage on the paternal sides that hails to the lower Vistula uh, pasture lands on the Baltic sea coast that Penny mentioned, not far from Gdansk in today's Poland. Now, I will also say that the little dead bugs right in the <laughs> foreground uh, refer to every summer's little plague of box elder beetles. Um, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but in our house we are referring to them as Republicans. Um, so, but now we better go inside. So if you would, um, let's say we, we pretend we're in our uh, dining room, and one of the prints I have on the wall there is entitled in it's it's an, a german inscription but if you if you would read it you will see the artist wrote their new life for reinhild kauenhoven 1941 in parenthesis year of war it is a woodcut it is hand tinted and 1941 was the year of my birth this was the year of Pearl Harbor, the siege of Leningrad, the destruction of my grandparents' home in Hamburg by British bombs. The mother nursing the child sits in a marred or jarred landscape. Below her feet, in the ground, you see a skeleton, symbol of death, and reminder of our mortality, a memento mori. The healthy infant and the jaw of water next to the mother's feet are symbols of life, as is the sun, set in opposition to the destruction of what we see in the background. The artist was a close friend of my father, my father who collected prints throughout his life. This was the artist's gift uh, to my parents, to me, to celebrate my coming into this world, into that particular year of war. And I'm really sad to say, we continue to be in years of war. The theme of mother and child, just in connection with that image, 
uh, is both very ancient and universal, of course. Here we see a sculpture by a Congo artist to your left, and I just discussed it in my African art class on Wednesday. It is used in fertility rituals. It was probably carved in the 19th century. And we see to the right um, a very differently uh, shaped, um, but still the same universal theme image by the 15th century painter, um, the master of Flemai, um, an altarpiece with the Maria Lactans or the nursing um, uh, Mary, a very, very favorite theme at the time. Now, since we're in the library here, I thought it would be appropriate to show another print that you would find in our living room. And this is a page, one page, from the Nuremberg Chronicle, a history of the world that was printed in German <coughs> and in Latin in the year 1493. In, addition, in an edition of about 2,500 copies with about 1,800 woodcut illustrations. So you could order a Latin or a German uh, edition, and this is the, uh, the uh, page from the German edition. This was published um, by the well-known publisher Anton Koberger in collaboration between scholars, artists, and investors, and was a very early capitalist enterprise, a landmark in the history of the printed book. Now, the, the woodcut illustrations on this um, page show in the upper left-hand corner St. Tim Timothy, a disciple of the Apostle Paul. Um, then um, to the right, in the middle, St. Dionysos, or, or St. Denis, the patron saint of France and the first bishop of Paris. And you can see that he is carrying his head um, in his hands he was beheaded by the Roman colonial powers in France sometime in the third century, and after being beheaded, his body miraculously rose to its feet, yes, Eleanor, carrying its severed head to the place later known as the Mount of Martyrs, or Montmartre. I'm sure that many of you who have been at Montmartre went there for totally other reasons and never thought what that place actually means. Anyway, and we see another bishop who was tortured to death by Emperor Nero, but what fascinates me about this in particular is St. John the Evangelist, the largest woodcut on the lower right, um, at the time when he was banned to the Aegean island of Patmos. He has uh, briefly stopped here writing his book of Revelation as he is beholding um, the vision that he has of the woman robed with a son who symbolizes the church. You can check that out in John 12, verses eight, uh, 1 through 6. Now, in this detail, you can see him a little bit better. So, perched next to the evangelist is his symbol, the eagle, which stretches out his left Claw, I think you can see that, just like John is sticking his left foot out from his garment. I just love that little scene and how his foot, you know, <laughs> echoes that of the bird. I wonder what the artist thought, but it must have been done on purpose. So he's stretching it out to air out his hot foot or um, to, to, you know, in, in his excitement about his vision, he, he, his body can't be still. Um, now, I discovered this illustrated book page from 1493, totally by chance, in a Topeka fleet market, somewhere here on 23rd Street, during some noon hour. I felt when I saw it immediately connected to my roots and was especially taken by the image of St. John, who had just been the subject of some of my research. And now, this, of course, I don't have in my house. This is a 16th century um, major work by a German artist uh, who was a subject of my dissertation as well. But later, I investigated this particular painting by this artist that is in, in Regensburg. It's called The Two Saints John. And what I was interested in in this painting were the three medicinal plants 
that you see in the immediate foreground. Um, both saints were regarded as major healing saints during the Middle Ages and right into the 19th century. John the Evangelist's healing plant is sage. He's sitting on the left <coughs> and the sage is growing right here. So um, sage, of course, from the Latin salvia, meaning health or healthy. And since antiquity, until today, sage is one of the most commonly used universal healing herbs. Or do you say herbs? <laughs> Today's uses include it as an antiperspirant for wound treatment, as preservative, as digestive aid, as treatment in diabetes, sore throat, and in women's health. The healing plant on the other side that is associated with John the Baptist is Merlin, and you can see it growing right next to him there, and you see it in Kansas along the roadsides in the ditches, blooming as, ta as a tall yellow candle at the time of, saint of the saint's feast, uh, which is in late June. Now, this work, let's see, you would have to go upstairs into one of the children's rooms. That is where I have this etching by uh, a German artist, Johanna Obermüller. She did this in 1979. The title, it's a very tiny print, like that. Um, the title is The Battle of Alexander Undecided. And it was a gift to me from my sister Hendrikje, who chose it in reference to my dissertation uh, topic and the subsequent book about the 16th century German artist Albrecht Altdorfer. So the artist um, echoes a, an early 16th century work, which is very, quote, famous, uh, which is this one. It used to be in the uh, textbooks, but um, the canon sometimes shifts, as we all know. So this is Altdorfer's uh, Battle of Issus, which had taken place in 333 BCE. Um, those were one, that's, that's one date that I learned, I think, in sixth grade, um, with a little rhyme. Drei, 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 Issus Keilerei, which means 333, you know, the battle at Issus, but in German you can make it rhyme, and that's how you can learn historical dates. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is when Alexander the Great defeated the Persian King Darius. The painting had been commissioned for the Munich Palace of William IV of Bavaria in 1529. Now, 1529 was the exact year when Ottoman Turks were trying to invade Vienna after having conquered much of Eastern Europe. I remember when I was first in Vienna, while it was still occupied in the 1950s at age 14. And one of the friends who toured the town with me pointed out a, a Turkish cannonball in order to explain to me how slow, slow, how slow things were in Austria. Um, so there was a <laughs> long time frame. Anyway, so the image was of great contemporary relevance in 1529 for any Western European ruler at the time all of whom wished to be identified with the victorious Greek, that is, the Western ruler. And less than 300 years later, Emperor Napoleon, in the throes of conquering all of Europe, had his offers, officers appropriate Aldover's Battle of Alexander away from Bavaria and had it shipped to hang in his bathroom for close viewing so he could also identify with Alexander as conqueror and founder of a great empire. Now, the small, tiny print upstairs in our home, Hoibuden, shows a variation of that theme and composition of Altdorfer's painting. We see two armies pitted against each other, um, following orders from the governing anonymous machine-like men on the two mountaintops in a cosmic landscape, seen like Altdorfer's battle from a planetary perspective. Now, in contrast to the 16th century battle painting here, the battle is yet undecided. 
The print was made during the Cold War, 10 years before the fall of communism in Europe. And it's sort of a permanent standstill, like you see in the two rhinoceroses that are pitched uh, against each other. Um, Today, more than 2,000 years after Alexander the Great's war to conquer Persia, the power wars between West and East go on, and both the 16th century painting and the 20th century tiny print have the same significance in terms of their relevance to our wars and their senseless futility as they did in the times when these works were created. Okay, just for a little uh, comic relief, maybe. Um, you see on the right um, a print uh, that is in our living room. If you were there, you would see that um, by uh, Matilda Pleslova. Uh, it was done in 1968. It was a gift from my father in the sense that I was allowed to choose between several prints that were available that year to members of the print society to which he belonged, and this was my choice. Uh, it, it makes me smile because it is an irreverent take on Leonardo's icon, uh, and the curlers make her ordinary and take her from her throne. It also evokes memories, of course, of my younger years when I, too, tortured my hair in my head with such <laughs> curlers. Trying to sleep with those things was a pain. One suffered gladly for the sake of beauty, as one thought. The curlers in Mona Lisa's hair also comment on the original Mona Lisa's appearance. If we pay attention to that in comparison with other Italian portraits of the time, she actually appears rather unmade up, yeah, rather plain and undressed in terms of her hair. All formal portraits of that time typically show extremely careful and elaborate uh, hairdressing and hairdos. So she's shown in a very private, private at home um, mode. Um, if she would not wear her hair down like that if she were in, in public, just as girls in Germany of my generation would not be seen in public with their curlers in, which was one of the first culture shocks I had when I came as a student to Newton in 1960. Okay, if you go up into my study, you would see this object. Um, I call it a South African paintbrush. This was a thesis project by a graduate student at Cape Town School of Fine Arts, done in 1982. I saw this object in the student's studio, and I asked to buy it. I think she asked me for $20. I asked to buy it because it encapsulates for me my entire experience of living in apartheid South Africa. What you see is a most ordinary mass-produced paintbrush from a hardware store that is wrapped very tightly with thread that keeps changing from black to white to black to white to black to white, etc., making one's eyes flicker, unsure, tired, and sore. And the bristles of the brush are black. Looking at the handle, one senses pain in one's hand because fastened to the handle are thorns from a South African thorn bush as if it is growing right off the handle of the brush. The thorns are wrapped in the same black and white yarn. The brush can only be used by someone who is courageous enough to endure the discomfort and pain the thorns will cause while painting. Lacking this courage, one does not paint. That means one does not make art that speaks to truth. One avoids dealing with the reality and injustice of the, quote, thorn of apartheid. This brush stands as a symbol of the creative act which needs to deal with the pain of injustice and lack of freedom, injuring the humanity of all people across artificial barriers. Next to the brush, we see its wrapping paper, <clears throat> a Xerox copy, actually, of a well-known painting by minimalist painter Bridget Riley, entitled Currents. The black ribbon around the paper 
that the artist copied, um, you notice there's a small black ribbon, refers to the black sash, name of a very courageous interracial women's group in South Africa that fought to end apartheid. So, this then is my souvenir from South Africa. Not an ostrich egg or a cute little card and uh, antelope. Because this object communicates the situation of the artist or of any person in racially divided South Africa and beyond. During apartheid, nothing could be thought, said, seen, done without things falling immediately apart into black and white. And that exactly was the wound, the thorn of apartheid in South Africa. Some of you might remember I gave a talk uh, once um, about the uh, art I collected in Rwanda after the genocide from children. Um, we are looking here at a drawing. Now, this I do not have framed in my house. It is too difficult to look at every day. It is uh, stored. But it is in my house, in my study. We're looking at a drawing by Umu Kesha Karin, a Rwandan Tutsi orphan girl of about 16 years old, um, which talks about her witness of the murder of her fellow Tutsi people, including her parents, by the Hutu people of her country in April, May 1994. She made the drawing six months later, December 6, 1994, when I visited her in the village of Kayenzi in Rwanda. I had brought paper and crayons along and asked her to tell her story in pictures. She organized her memory in a sequence of narrow bands, starting on the top. We see Hutu milita uh, militias with clubs and machetes, hacking and clubbing uh, their Tutsi victims to death, tossing the dead into great communal pits or into the river, um, which is flowing right by Kayenzi. Along the bottom of the page, we see how people flee with their belongings, some carrying loads on their heads, herding cattle along, while dying and dead bodies lie along the road. The only colors Umakesha used in her drawing, and I gave her a whole box of crayons, are green for grass and roadside forest, and red for blood of the wounded and the dying. On the back of the same piece of paper, oh, did I have this on all the time? No. Did no, I? That's new one. Is this new? Yes. Okay. Good, then I'm fine. Okay. On the back of the same piece of paper that I just described, she drew the internal ref refugee camp in a private school in Rwanda, the women busy over their pots on cooking fires, children carrying firewood and water. We see the French soldiers and their tents, whose t and their task was to protect the refugees. We see the makeshift grass huts of more refugees. While working in Rwanda, Burundi, and Eastern Congo under the auspices of Mennonite Central Committee together with my husband, I collected other children's drawings about the experience of that genocide. They were published in our book called Do I Still Have a Life? Voices from the Aftermath of War in Rwanda and Burundi. And more recently, uh, they were made available for worldwide access on the web by the Center for Genocide Studies at the University of Florida. In the spring of 2007, I was in Paraguay to study Paraguayan contemporary art in preparation for a major exhibition which I curated here for Washburn's Mulvane Art Museum. This drawing by the Paraguayan Indian artist Ogwa captures a ritual of the Chamacoco Indians of Paraguay. The artist's caption translates as, and we have a chair of the Modern Language Department, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's your translation actually, 
The mythical beings look for food for the ancestors. Anyway, are two masqueraders or shamans in costumes of feathers and body paint each hold up a large turtle. Agua is a highly regarded self-taught artist whose mission it is to document in his drawings the indigenous myths, the ritual life and healing activities of shamans, of his people, so that knowledge will not become entirely lost, that that knowledge will not become entirely lost in an environment where many indigenous people have been displaced, impoverished, their traditional life ways threatened and destroyed. This particular drawing uh, in our stairwell was a gift to me by a Paraguayan artist friend who is both Indian and Spanish, of Indian and Spanish descent, one who also honors her Indian woods in her work. In this trilogy, um, this is called Pine Box 5, 6, and 7 um, of prints by our daughter Gazina, was inspired by her mourning her grandfather's death in 1992. Um, his sons and grandsons crafted the simple coffin from pine wood. The artist, Gazina, references the fine craftsmanship and expression of their love and respect by detailing the dovetailed joints. You can see that in the drawing to the right. A large wing forms and rises above the coffin or house, signifying the spirit of the deceased that lives on in his descendants and all whose lives he had touched. The work transcends the very personal experience on which it is based, and I think it may speak to all of us about the mortality of the body and the immortality of the spirit. The wing as a metaphor for the, of the latter is a motif we often find in art, as, for example, in this monumental work by the contemporary German artist on the Kiefer. And here you might get the hint that we're coming to the end, right? Every good slideshow mm -hmm. ends with a sun, but I'm not showing you a sunset. Okay, this print is in one of the halls in our house. It is called Sun Celebration by the Kansas-based artist Robert Regeer. It's a wood block print, which um, we purchased from him in 1973. When you look closely, you can see that the green uh, of the earth and the blue color of the horizon um, are printed from two boards. You can see the grain of the wood if you look closely. Those two boards came from a recycled old wooden fence which my husband had built to rein in our toddler son on our yard. A fence which we later traded with the artist who needed the fence for one of his paintings. And my husband has that painting in his study at KU and I still don't get it to get home until he really retires. And I am, so I can't show you that glorious painting which also deals with the sun. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you have ever lived in a part of the world where you rarely see the sun or feel its warmth, you really come to love the sun shining over Kansas as I have. There are many things I like about this print but we're nearing our end. And just by way of comparison, as one does in art history, right, Glenda? The old Verflinian method. Um, to go back in time, way back, again, the sun, as, as so many of the small things we have in our house in the way of art, have reverberations throughout history and are part of the universal themes that artists deal with. The ancient Egyptians, celebrated the sun as giver of life, as in this 4,000-year-old wall painting from an Egyptian tomb. 
The scene is one that is also often depicted in the Book of the Dead. The sun disk signifies the sun god Ra, and below the god Horus, king of the, king of the earth and a force for good, holds the looped cross known as the Ankh, symbolic of everlasting life. And on this positive note, I say goodbye as you are leaving my home, and thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, we thank you, Reinhold, for your outstanding and thought-provoking lecture, last lecture, and present you with this perpetual plaque with your name on it, which will now remain in the library, I understand. So it's a sort of tribute to the last lectures at Aperon. Um, this lecture was made possible with the support from the Washburn University Foundation, and Dr. Jansen has generously requested that, a co that her this year's contribution be made to the Art Department Scholarship Fund. Thank you all for coming. Please go downstairs to the reception and the poster sessions. Thank <laughs> <laughs>